So I created something called Pico EMP, which is an electromagnetic fault injection tool. Um, you can see this nice safety shield over the high voltage side, and it basically allows you to relatively safely insert um, high electromagnetic uh, pulses into a device. So I'm gonna use this Trezor Bitcoin wallet I've used in other examples. Um, you can see the case is a bit open because I've been doing other stuff with it. And what you can see is that it'll show this hard fault detected message uh, because it's actually detecting that a fault has been inserted, right? As some of its protections that detect some of these weird faults. Um, and you can see here, I can reset it and stuff. And I'm doing this through the enclosure, interestingly. So there's a lot of cool stuff with um, EMFI. And this works because the microcontroller is so close to the, the case of this. Um, so you can see normally we'd put it right over the microcontroller um, and insert faults in a similar way or from the behind. Uh, here you can see I've triggered like this unofficial firmware detected message uh, because I actually corrupted the SHA uh, firmware verification that occurs on boot. Um, so you can cause errors without totally resetting it. That's the real power of vault injection. Um, so the device itself looks something like this. Uh, this green board I'm going to show you first because it has, you can see those slots on the backside. So the shield is just an off the shelf um, Hammond plastic part. So you can just buy it off DigiKey and uh, it fits in to shield your fingers from the high voltage side. Um, and what I'm actually gonna use is the, the kind of production boards or these red boards um, that'll pull up here, except if I pull the red board up, I forgot the shield. So I messed up the panelization um, on this one. So I'm waiting for the next version, uh, but it's more or less the exact same. Um, it was just the green ones were the ones I had first when I was doing a real fast proto turn. Um, so inside of that high voltage area, you basically have some inputs that come in this case from a Raspberry Pi Pico, uh, but you could drive them from an Arduino or anything else. Um, part of it, so there's these two transformers here, so you can kind of see some windings if you go on the side. Um, these are actually designed as like flash, these types of you know, high voltage transformers. Um, I use one to drive a high voltage circuit here, um, which charges this capacitor uh, with a switch that discharges the capacitor through a resistor. So it's kind of a little extra safety feature. Um, if you were to remove the shield, which of course you should never do, or run it with the shield off, um, there's a way to discharge the capacitor. So how much voltage are we talking here? Uh, if we look at this device, um, it has, so as another thing you should never do is, you know, probe it live, um, but I've added test points because you also want to be able to do that safely, right? It's like abstinence education doesn't really work. Um, so here we have a safe way of, of doing this. And you can see it's at like 240 volts. Um, when we discharge it, it does discharge by itself. Part of this is due to the 10 mega ohm resistor of the DMM, um, but there is kind of a, a high resistance uh, value to in, in the circuit. And we press the button to discharge it, you can see the voltage falling. Um, so the recovery isn't super fast. And that's, you know, there's, this is a low, you saw the size of those transformers. This is not a high power circuit. We have a higher end device called chip shredder, which uses like a transformer that weighs more than this entire device. Um, but it does work. And, and the other thing I'm showing here is this is the voltage output of the optocoupler that's used to provide feedback. Um, you can actually see there's a linear, so there's an analog measurement capability. You'd have to calibrate it and it's very not reliable because this is like current transfer characteristic of an optocoupler, which is not, is not constant with anything. Um, but it does provide, you know, go, no go, and you can potentially calibrate it. So there's a lot of kind of features that are baked into this thing uh, or feature capability. So to give you an idea of what the output looks like, here's a uh, low inductance resistor that I'm gonna connect onto the output. Um, I'm then going to use a differential probe. So some of this, this setup, by the way, came from chip shouter development, the larger unit um, we sell. And so there's quite a bit of experience in building that. That's also kind of worked into this, this real low cost one. So if I connect the differential probe in, um, this will let me kind of safely probe the voltages without if there was any sort of ground loops worrying about them. You know, for this design, it shouldn't be an issue, um, but because I already had the setup, why not? Um, so if we click the, the trigger button, 
You can see here, it's basically going up to like 250 volts, so that 50 div uh, per second scale. It's not super fast, so change the, the time scale here. Um, you know, it's it, you don't want too fast a rise time in a way on this output um, because that can add ringing. If you're trying to do a low cost device, you don't want to have to add a lot of complex output circuitry um, to deal with that. So. Uh, it works pretty well, and if, if we trigger it repeatedly, what we'll see is we'll actually see the capacitor bank voltage drop. So if I hold down the button, it's basically every 100 milliseconds or so um, sending an output pulse. So what you can see is that if you try to do it that quickly, it's not going to keep up that high output voltage. It doesn't have um, the ability, which I showed before when you could see the bank voltage drop. Um, but that just kind of gives you an idea for what it, it looks like. Um, now, of course, that's just a resistor. Let's put an inductor on this thing. Let's put a coil and, and see what it actually looks like. So I put a coil on the output um, and then I'm gonna, it's off right now, don't worry, I'm not gonna blow the capacitor up. Um, and I'm gonna roughly probe it to try to get the output. So this is the points that go to the SMA connector. Um, this is what it looks like, you know, right at the circuit. It'll be a bit less at the coil itself. Um, if we, so this is the old waveform, sorry. If I trigger the pulse, uh, what you'll see here is the coil voltage. And it looks pretty good. I, you know, I think it's actually pretty impressive for this very low cost, simple device. It's going up to still 200 volts. We're relatively narrow. This is being driven with like one millisecond wide pulse at the, the input to that gate drive transformer. So you saw how that looked before. Um, but it works relatively well. And this is our output that's going into the coil, right? The coil itself limits how wide it can go based on the, the size of the coil and stuff like that. Um, the other cool thing, right? So that was the output to the coil. Let's look at the input to the transistor that was switching that capacitor onto the coil. This is the real kind of magic of the whole thing. Um, so Q2 in this schematic is an IGBT. I was lazy on the schematic, sorry, it shows a MOSFET symbol. Um, but basically we need to generate a high voltage on that gate or you know, higher voltage, like 12 volts, 15 volts. And so it uses a transformer to couple the 3.3 volts up to 12 volts. Um, this is what it looks like. So here's like, tw the, notice the scale is weird. I'll change that to five volts a div in a second. Um, but the we're getting this nice peak going up to like 15 volts and sticking around at like 12 or so volts um, and this is key because for an igbt um, a like a mosfet you want to avoid the gate going too high so the absolute maximum voltage is 30 volts uh, similar to MOSFET, large MOSFET ratings. If you exceed that, it will kind of immediately destroy the device. So you have to be very careful. The circuit uses a zener to clamp it. Um, the other thing with an IGBT, it needs to go higher than 10 volts often. So if you're used to a MOSFET thinking 10 volts is the magic, um, we push it up to about, you could see it peaking about 15. Um, but if you look at 10, right, stuff is not fully saturated, uh, not fully turned on at all collector current. So that's why you want to go higher to make sure we're pushing the device into saturation for that initial dump into the end, uh, end coil. Um, so the coil itself, I'm using these chip shader probe tips that come with the larger chip shader device. You know, those are going to be very expensive, more expensive than this tool alone. Um, you can also wind your own coil. So there's some details in the, the Pico EMP repository, uh, right? So we we sell all the tips with chip shader, but we also show you how to build um, some of your own if you're curious or using some off the shelf part, you can sort of combine the two of them. Um, the other thing to help make Pico EMP available, we're looking at is a actual sort of kit build. Um, and it would have the surface mount parts done uh, and you'd have to solder on the, the Pico itself. And part of that's for uh, issues around compliance and stuff like that, that we can't really sell a, a complete tool, um, you know, as low cost as we want. But hopefully you enjoy, you know, seeing what you can do with a low cost device uh, and build your own or look out for the kit in the future and enjoy exploring electromagnetic fault injection. And you can even do a board like that that's like a milled board to, to make your own. So anyway, have fun.